I'm very happy to be able to be here right at this point in time and maybe, you know, uh, from this slightly more, slightly more technical or slightly more on the ground experiences of a policy officer in the European Commission and the Secretary General to talk about what this energy union project means and what we are trying to achieve with that and how that fits in with the political priorities of the Commission. And then I just draw something here, I was reading through this latest and quite getting quite some, um, uh, some purchase book by the IIEA talking about the consequences of Brexit and everything to do with that, which said, well, actually, there's, even if we were talking about a half-out or half-in approach, energy is one of the areas where there's going to be likely to be cooperation with UK, full UK involvement. And then maybe this sort of links to some of the areas that we're going to be discussing about regional cooperation, uh, inter management of systems on a regional level, and, and, and benefiting as part of a wider European approach. First of all, for where am I in the, in the, in the normal things? Uh, Helen mentioned that I work in the Secretary General. Now, those of you who are sensible have no interest in the internal politics of the Commission. Nonetheless, I'm going to indulge just for a moment on what that means and why, why it's important. One of the things that you could say that's happening inside the Commission is there's a sense that there's a strong need to ensure that the coherence and the coordination of policy is done at a more stronger level and a more coherent way from the beginning. So we have what might be called ex-ante coordination instead of ex-post coordination. On one level, this is seen by the appointment of vice presidents, whose job was not to manage individual directors, general or ministries, but rather to act as a deputy Tishi or de act as deputy prime ministers would, to coordinate the work on specific policy areas, bringing together the work of different directorates general and different commissioners, more to the point, to stop having a sense that policy was unconnected with each other and to ensure that from the very beginning policies were conceived in a joined up way. And which policies were to be particularly important in this, especially now as we have a vice president who's clearly making sure that we don't have extraneous policies in vice president Timmermans, first vice president Timmermans, well, they were to be reflecting the political priorities set by President Juncker when he was candidate Juncker and when he was appointed by, when he was nominated by the council and later appoint, and set out in his political program to the parliament. And of those 10 political priorities, one of them was very clearly energy. And that's not an accident. It's because in searching and looking at where areas that Europe could do better looking forward, so I could say even do even better, one of the clearest areas was energy talking to stakeholders, politicians, policymakers across Europe. This is already clear. These are senses that were already clear, which is not a sense of having we had a disaster for the last five years and we need to improve it. It's like this is one of the areas where we are hitting huge challenges, some of them challenges of success, and we have to ensure that we bring a coherence to energy policy and to climate policy that cuts across the entire policy making of the DG. And that's why Energy Union was one of the first political deliveries of this commission. I think the second after, um, after the investment fund, after the, the Juncker fund. So, what is our vision of an energy union? I actually think this is a, something that's very useful to look at when you're reading the document. Start off at the beginning and see what is the vision it's delivering, that it aims to deliver. Let's judge some of the successes based on that. Are we able to do it? Well, the vision is of a energy union with solidarity, energy security based on solidarity and trust, that we can trust each other to deliver our aims, and that we can our solid we are solid we are act in solidarity with each other in terms of ensuring security supply, ensuring that we meet our aims, and that we speak with one voice in global affairs. I'll come back to each one of these later. Second point is that we have an integrated continent-wide European system that we don't think in terms of the systems as being broken up into national systems, that these borders are not how we manage the system, but we see them as operating as one, with energy flows across those systems. We have a sustainable low-carbon and climate-friendly economy, which means that we have renewables, that we have more energy efficiency, that we have um, uh, 
an integrated energy and climate policy, an integrated low carbon policy, integ integrating renewables with the wider part of it. We have the idea of strong and innovative European, competitive European economy. And here's one of the sections, because we're talking about the pillars, or rather, excuse me, the dimensions of the energy union strategy. One of the dimensions is research and innovation, which I think is going to be something that both up, is going to be the hardest level of work because it's really trying to bring things together that haven't worked necessarily all that well and really will show the benefits of the new approach in terms of how we deliver the energy strategy through innovative new companies in the future, linking um, the developments in information and computer technology through the requirements for energy efficiency, through to the integration of renewables into the wider linking of the retail market to the wholesale market and which companies are going to do this and how they're going to do it. And as an aside, I would say this is also something where Ireland potentially has huge potential to benefit with a strong ICT sector and very strong requirements in terms of managing the integration of renewables within the, in, within the system. And finally, the idea that citizens should be able to take ownership of the energy transition. This is the vision. It's set out at the very beginning of the document. And I, we see exactly how, where we are most successful or not over the next years. So if you want to see what that program translates into, and I'll come back to that at the end, there's action points and more to the point, a roadmap of specific proposals that are set out how to deliver the vision. The meat in between in the sandwich, that is setting out in more detail what that means and how it's going to be done and why we think certain things. But I think if you just start off with those two documents, the beginning and the end of this presentation, maybe you could all go home and that would, you wouldn't have to put up with listening to me. <laughs> So, energy security delivered based on solidarity and trust. What kind of contra concrete actions are we delivering here? Well, last year it's very clear, and actually for longer than that, that we've had challenges coming from our dependence on the single supplier in many member states. What we need to do is to have a resilient and diverse secure supplies of gas into Europe. And we have to be sure of our security of gas supply. Take into account <coughs> the lessons that we learned from last year's stress tests. Work towards practical implementation of our energy security strategy. So right now in the Commission, we are looking at developing proposals on a new updated gas security supply regulation, which will make concrete some of the recommendations, the lessons that we learned from the stress test last year. We also recognize that our dependence on a single supplier is often driven by being picked out individually by the weaknesses that individual member states can sometimes have when they are faced with negotiating with a strong partner. <coughs> and so these weaknesses are exploited within intergovernmental agreements, which is why there's already a commission decision giving the commission a power of ex post review of intergovernment agreements relating to uh, well, energy supplies. Um, a strong sense looking at the evidence, if you read through the document and you see why, that this needs to be looked at again. And that we need to take account of two things. First of all, ex post is maybe too late. And the second point is, the related point is, well actually, sometimes the intergovernmental agreement where a member state has entered into negotiations with a large energy supplier who might be trying to exploit its vulnerable position, the real damage, so to speak, is being done in the commercial agreement associated with that. And so we're looking very carefully at how we can ensure that that's not what's happening, that the Commission has effective access to ensure that the commercial agreements associated with the inter intergovernmental agreements are not undermining the internal market and our collective security supply. Recognising, of course, the need to ensure commercial confidentiality. This isn't a, a procedure for just opening up all kinds of uh, information to the wider public. But to anybody who says, well, look, at how can we do that? How can we trust the Commission to look at this kind of commercial information? I'd say, I mean, DG competition on a regular basis. 
looks at the most sensitive areas of competition. And if there's one area that we can be fairly confident that we don't get leaks in in Brussels, it's out of DG competition in relation to state aid investigations or antitrust investigations or merger investigations. This information doesn't leak. The Commission is perfectly able to keep this information confidential. But nonetheless, ensure that the aims and purposes of the terror market are met. Then we have the idea of creating and facilitating a diversification of energy supplies, looking at alternative supplies coming from the southern corridor and what needs to be done to realize that, ongoing discussions with states in the region, and looking at alternative supplies in terms of using our LNG facilities <coughs> with development of a, an LNG strategy. And here I could put the emphasis on using as well as building new ones. There are LNG facilities available within Europe, and we have to look at, well, what are the blocks? Is the problem that you cannot import to Spain and then transport that to other parts of Europe, that you cannot import to the Netherlands and then reverse flow all the way to different parts of Germany or even further east? These are practical issues about how the system is operated as a whole, as well as looking at where additional LNG might be needed as part of a increase in the robustness and the resilience of the European system. Looking at the uh, aims of creating a fully integrated internal energy market, let's look at some of the concrete actions, some of them literally concrete, poured into the ground. Well, building on the work we have already, there's a electricity infrastructure regulation and the projects of common interests and looking for the second list of projects of common interest and how that can be done. But think here, there's two points I want to emphasize that are particularly interesting from, a, from an Irish point of view, which will be the European Electricity Market Design Project and the regional cooperation, how that happens. <coughs> so the European Electricity Design is in some respects, it's the complement from the gas side of looking at security supply, which also looks at the security of electricity supply. The complement on the, in the electricity side is the market design. And it's the sense of stepping up to the challenge, as I say, the challenge of success, that we have large volumes of renewables on the system that we have to manage and manage in an efficient way, that we have to ensure that investments are made in the future based on clear long-term market signals, that we have to ensure that renewables and new renewables can be built based on this and that they can be traded across borders, both in the short term and in thinking in the long term. And these are the issues that are being looked at in terms of market design. And another final, very important thing here is the aim of market design is to take the benefit of new information, computer technology, ICT, and to link the wholesale and the retail markets so that this idea that consumers and citizens can participate in the electricity transition, the energy transition, is real. So right now, we in the Commission are at the advanced stages of preparing a consultative communication to look at all these areas, which we hope to publish or we intend to publish in July. And that will set out questions. We will set out a political vision and also concrete questions. Political questions, but also technical questions about how this market design should look in the future. What that will involve in the next steps are, well, we'll have the first reports back with the State of the Energy Union at the end of the year, but I'll come back to the State of the Energy Union leading to the development of detailed legislation built on engagement with stakeholders, which is already starting, over the next year and a half, year, year and a half, so that by the end of 2016, we should have concrete legislative proposals on the table. They should be well linked to other areas I'm going to come to now, very well linked to the future of renewables and the renewables reform of the renewables directive. It should be very clear. It should address issues that are burning for many people, how to integrate capacity mechanisms across borders, how to address this question of state <coughs> interventions, how to ensure that the short-term and the long-term security of the system is delivered, looking at how we can trade across borders, as I say, long-term and short-term. I'm not making any of the other points less important. I just noticed the time and I'm focusing on what I think maybe the audience is most interested in here. But feel free to raise your hand and say, actually, Ty, talk about vulnerable consumers or energy prices and costs. 
energy efficiency. Again, one of the dimensions, one of the important dimensions of systems. So some of this is building on um, existing work. Clearly, the energy efficiency directive is already there, but it's looking at how it can be renewed. And I would say that one of the clear and important issues here is going to be getting the link between energy efficiency, some of the elements of the energy efficiency directive that have already started, which annoy certain energy suppliers, it's 1% obligation, but looking at that and seeing how can we actually begin to again deliver the transition to um, energy service companies, linking back to the wholesale retail market integration. What are the areas that we have to really look at in terms of where do the obligations sit at European level, in terms of delivering our ambition, and where does this come out of national levels? We want to develop, related to that, a heating and cooling strategy. Now, I could put this under a renewables area or this other area, but in terms of where do we consume energy, and we consume it for heating and cooling in large part. So looking at what flows out of that. Um, the work has already started on this, we started through the detailed analytical work for the review of the, starting to do the detailed analytical work for the review of the Energy Efficiency Directive, which was itself tied to the wider aim of the European Union to look forward towards an increase in our ambition from the 27% set by the European Council last year up to 30% increase in energy efficiency. Another important point here, and we see it in the actions as well, is the aim to have a smart, build, smart finance or smart buildings approach. This is not necessarily, necessarily, although it might need some complementary, a legislative proposal. There are different tools that can be used that exist already to achieve this. And we're looking at those in quite some detail to see how can we do that. What tools, and then flowing out of that, if we need to have support from existing financial institutions and a framework for doing that, whether we need to have some changes to some legislation. This is not primarily a legislative approach. <clears throat> Decarbonizing the economy. So, it's very easy to say we're going to hit 40% reductions. Well, in greenhouse gas emissions, 43% reductions in the ETS sector. We start to see the interactions now, though. That's 30% in the energy non ETS sector give or take, it's 30%. How do we do that? Well, where does it come from? How much is it delivered by the heating and cooling strategy and a shift towards renewables? Our energy efficiency and the electricity market design. Each one of these dimensions are very much that. It's just a prism by which you can look at the overall challenges that we have. Well, two points I want to raise here in terms of looking at these interactions is the looking at road transport. It's going to be incredibly important and it's what we are, it's part of our aims to integrate and to mainstream the connections between the transport agenda and the, and the energy agenda and the climate agenda. And again, I point out that this is one of the reasons why we now have a, uh, a vice president for energy union who's able to bring this together at an early stage and look at it and see the connections between climate policy and transport policy. In terms of renewables, well, Again, in renewables, we have the challenge of a European target of 27%. But does that translate into national targets? Do we build up or do we build down? Well, I think the aim is to be, no matter what, to be clear that we're doing, meeting our aims in a cost-effective way. And this is where we'll see, and you'll see it already coming in the proposals, or in the consultation, excuse me, in July, the beginnings of this link to be drawn out between cross-border participation and allowing renewables to be traded across borders effectively, renewable energy. Taking on board the lessons from the experience with the cooperation mechanism, looking for ways that can be improved or where its shortcomings can be addressed, and remembering that this is a European target now. I'm nearly finished, and then we can start moving to actual questions, and maybe you can uh, 
see what you can actually drag out of me that I haven't said or what you think I haven't said. But I want to point this out here, this link between the integrated set plan, the idea of looking at research innovation, having a global technology innovation and leadership, thinking of a way that we can develop the technologies in Europe and then export them related to renewables, related to energy efficiency, related to the management of the system, something that Airgrid already has experience with here, maybe in advance of anybody else, as well as the link with transport. I just want to focus here on the pure energy side of things. In the preparation of the energy union framework strategy and the preparation of that document, this was the hardest part to write. I can tell you that it was changing radically right up to the very end as the need to bring all these different parts together led you to look at it in slightly different ways with the clear knowledge at all stages that it was critically important that we begin to deliver on this. It's also one, I think, where you can see, again, the value of this new approach that, from this commission, which will be, hopefully, can deliver successes, but so we come back in five years' time and say this has been a success, where it links together work in the Joint Research Centre, in the Director General for Research and Technological Development, in DG Enter, in DG Trade. Actually, in this stage, I was calling up, I said, well, actually, there's more than that. There's DG Education and Culture, which has these... Um, knowledge and innovation clusters, which are located there. And they've got a very good one here in that. So why aren't we hearing from them yet? So I had to call up people directly and say, well, look, what's, what's the feed in here? Because the areas of research, innovation, education are spread out. And yet this is where the answers to delivering our problems are going to be. Now, we will see the first results of the new way of thinking with the focus on four key areas that were set out in the Energy Union document coming in the second half of this year with the new set plan, with the, with the communication of the set plan. I think next year then we'll start to see this coming in the energy, energy global technology and innovation leadership where the DGs, where the directorates general, where the staff, where the technical people are really sitting together and, throw, and working these ideas out now and seeing where the interactions between each other's policies are and how that can be done to deliver with the benefits that that's bringing. And that's, as again, I'll say, my little bit of own propaganda for what I think Ireland can do. It's where there are real gains here where it's talking about the application of information technology and computer technology. I read through some statistics shortly before I came here talking about how much more the proportion of GDP Ireland's GDP was, was from ICT. And that's not just transfer pricing. And some of those skills and knowledge and understanding are precisely what's going to be needed to manage the energy transition. So, looking at governance. Well, the European Commission has committed to producing an annual State of the Energy Union report. This will serve as the key point where we can update on progress, update on the commitments and the undertakings that have been given by member states in relation to renewables or energy efficiency set out the way forward for what our policy proposals are likely to be. So, this is got, I think this will become a key date in the energy calendar from the future. So, when is the key date going to be? It's still being worked out precisely, but it'll be in the, towards the end of this year, in quarter three, four, well, actually quarter four, sorry, I shouldn't say three or four, in quarter four of this year. Um, we also are looking very, in very detail at how we can streamline the reporting and planning. So let's just talk about some of the reporting. And everybody knows and this is always hard work, but there's every, every piece of European legislation often has some kind of a report attached to it somewhere. And the aim is to bring those together as far as possible into a single report. Not every report will, will sit in it, but to bring the key political messages so that the messages don't get lost, so that the information that's been provided by member states is brought up and can be communicated and then used in an effective way. So while reporting shouldn't be just for its own sake, it's also the consolidation of reporting shouldn't be just for its own sake. It's to allow a policy development process to be done effectively. We're also looking in detail about what this means for the reporting of member states in terms of their planning. Ireland's developing a white paper. Um, well, how's that white paper development process going to fit into the wider European climate and energy and climate strategy? What elements do we think that need to be in that in order to 
allow the wider European Union to do its work. I could say the same thing about the UK or Germany or, or France or Poland. So there's a need to be an element of where we can collectively talk and send back the information over and back. So another element of fear of governance, and this is something I want to talk about as well, is the idea of the regional approach to the energy and climate policy framework. Now, there's two levels at which the regionalization can happen. One is the, let's call it the political level, where it's about the setting of targets and the understanding of the impact that each decision will have on its own. Well, if we expect to have 40% renewables in our energy in our electricity system, what does that mean for you and your neighboring system? What do we need to think about to integrate the systems between the UK and Ireland? Do we want to have that happen or not? High-level political regional approaches, a sharing of information, of development of structures. And the other level of which regional approach becomes very important is in the, in the practical day-to-day -day cooperation. And I think this is something where I'm very fortunate that I got to work in the Irish system as the single electricity market was integrated. I think many of the ideas that you see was like are fitted into that. The idea of having a cross-border system planning flowing out of wider energy policy targets. The idea of having cross-border system operation and cross-border market operation. Some of this will have to happen at a regional level, building on the experiences we've had so far across Europe, whether that was with day-ahead market coupling or elements of gas markets. That. So keeping these two regional approaches in common with each other is going to be very important. One, to allow policy decisions to be made. The other one, to allow the real effects of those policy decisions to be addressed. And for example, relating this back to the market design, there's no doubt that elements of market design will need to be implemented first on a regional level, just as we saw with market coupling and just as we see with many different areas. This will raise important issues for Ireland, clearly, in terms of how it relates to the wider regional areas that with France and the UK and how that's done in terms of both markets, market design elements of it, but also in terms of planning and thinking of how the interaction of those resources happen. And in very small writing, oops, action points. The action points is the, well, there's 15, <clears throat> depending on how you count it. You can, some sub points there. As usual, there are some negotiations about this, looking at the foreign element of it, the external dimension, with sub points within points. But I think they are set out something that you can hold the Commission's feet to the fire to in five years' time and say, did we deliver on those? I think equally, how they get translated into the annex to the Energy Union document is very important with the, I can't remember, 43 actions, 43 individual actions, again, with the possibility of things where they set out, look, these are the legislative programs that we imagine, these are the concrete initiatives, be that setting up an infrastructure forum, be that having a consultation on energy market design this year, or gas security supply legislation this year, or uh, review of the um, impact, sorry, excuse me, review of the uh, intergovernmental agreements next year. Thank you for your attention. So it normally comes up there, but I think I might have left it off. <laughs> um, I hope I've got given you some sense of where it is that we're coming from and how we see the interconnections between the different areas. I really look forward to taking questions and uh, even maybe giving you some more background on some of, some of the tensions in the development of the, 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 the documents. Thank you very much.